No New Year truce in the hostilities between the United States and the People's Republic of China. You would have thought they might have given it a break for a couple of days. After all, the year of the rabbit, which has just dawned, is a particularly auspicious year for China. The year of the rabbit usually comes with great success. But Joe Biden clearly isn't looking down that particular rabbit hole. He is still mounting provocation after provocation trying to provoke China into action on Taiwan so that they can impose full economic sanctions on China like they have on something like 55 countries in the world. More than half the people in the world are currently living under United States sanctions. I don't know how they keep track. Joe Biden couldn't keep track of a grocery list, but his country is sanctioning more than half the world and they are itching to do so against China. Thus, all kinds of flotillas and plans for flotillas in the South China Sea, in the Taiwan Straits, everywhere you can imagine. Biden is trying to dragoon former enemies, like Japan, for example, where the Japanese and American leadership this very week condemned the use of nuclear weapons in the country where the only ever use of nuclear weapons took place. I can't remember who it was that dropped them, who it was that suffered them. I've got a funny feeling it was the United States that dropped them and a funny feeling it was on Japan, but there they were warning China about nuclear weapons. China completely ringed by American nuclear armed bases. China would be, I think, well advised to seek, I don't know, some kind of defense agreement with Mexico. Maybe they could build some nuclear bases in Mexico. See how the United States likes it. They could steam their nuclear armed submarines off the coast of San Francisco. After all, Chinese people played a very important role in building it. Mexican people used to own it, but these are the vagaries of American politics and history. None of these things are ever remembered. The Cuban Missile Crisis maybe never happened, at least in the mind of US policy makers. Speaking of the US, and horrific atrocity. As far as I know, still unresolved with the gunman still at large. Ten people in Monterey, California, which conjures up images for me of, of love and peace, man, and tuning in and dropping out, but ten people lost their lives to machine gun fire. A man festooned in bandoliers of machine gun bullets was gunning down innocent people there in the land of the free, the home of the brave. And this country seeks to tell other countries how they should live, how they should organize themselves. Atlanta is in flames again, this time at the hands of so-called anti-fascists, who would have been better employed putting their obviously considerable energies into trying to stop a war in which the United States is on the side of the fascists and digging out this week another $2 billion to give to Zelensky and his wife who made a rather expensive trip to Davos. Much more about Davos later with the incomparable James Melville, but as an aside, what happens in Davos that Klaus Schwab, George Soros, and Bill Gates all decided to vacate it? Well, maybe James will have an idea about what's going on. But what we saw was going on was bad enough. It was a parade of second, third, fourth, and fifth raters demanding more and more weapons, more and more war being poured into the mall. They are, quite literally now, openly declaring their readiness to fight to the last Ukrainian, to the last drop of blood of the last Ukrainian. And even then they say that 
Russia will not be allowed to prevail in Ukraine, which, if you think about it, is a declaration of war, which would have to quickly become a nuclear war from one side or the other. Because if Ukraine loses on the battlefield, as it is presently doing very big time indeed, more than at any stage of the war, fully one-third of Ukraine is now Russian territory. And they are still declaring that Russia will not be allowed to prevail, which, if you think, as I say, must be a declaration that, if necessary, they intend to enter the war. So in Germany, in France, in Britain, and in the United States and Canada, you need to ask yourselves, are you ready for your son and daughter to die for Kopiansk? You need to ask yourselves, if you are ready to face the prospect of all-out European intermediate nuclear war, or even if it escalates into intercontinental ballistic war, which means the destruction of every city, every sizable town in the entire world, with the blast followed by the radiation, and then comes the nuclear winter. There will not even be any rabbits, even cockroaches, alive over that. So when your second, third, fourth, and fifth rate leaders in Davos are making these kind of statements, know that they have consequences. Because frankly, Russia, I think, has already concluded that NATO is now a party to the war. No more just offering moral, financial, even uh, military aid support to Ukraine. But Nobody with any seriousness believes that all this Western material that is arriving at the grossly depleted Ukrainian army barracks is actually going to be operated by Ukrainians. It can only be planned that this material is manned by NATO personnel. And if it is, well, we are at war with Russia. We who live in the NATO countries are in a state of war with Russia. And so far, it's a one-sided war. We are making war on Russia, but Russia is not as yet making war on us. But that must change. It's bound to change. This material will, I think, in the very near future, very near future, start to be attacked as it crosses the border, might even be attacked before it crosses the border. Why would Russia wait for all this NATO personnel and materiel to arrive on the battlefield? That would be, militarily speaking, extremely stupid. So I, I don't disguise my view. It's not, I'm sure, Russia's view. It's not anybody else's view, but it is mine that NATO is cruising for a bruising, that NATO needs a bloody good hiding. And I think it may very well be about to get one. Now, Boris Johnson, as I said, is in Ukraine, in Buka of all places, the site of one of the most notor notorious and naked provocations of the war, where bodies that were murdered by Ukrainian fascists were laid out on the ground. I've seen the footage of them being dragged around for the benefit of the cameras as if they had been murdered by the Russians when it is now known, it is known by every Western policymaker that these poor people were murdered by Ukrainian Nazis the Nazis that we have been funding throughout the war, the Nazis that have just been legitimized on certain social media platforms as no longer Nazis. It's apparently their swastikas are now, well, Hindu symbols. Apparently they're Sikh-hiling, jackbooting, anti-Semitic, pogromist past has been forgotten. They are now jolly good chaps, pucker fellows. But they were the ones who carried out the massacre in Buka. They were the butchers of Buka. And Boris Johnson is actually there right now. Perhaps he thought 
there was a very real need to divert attention from the Sunday Times revelations about him this morning, which I believe, maybe I'm the only person who believes it, are existential in their nature. Here, according to the Sunday Times, is what happened. Boris Johnson took a loan of £800,000. Well, he's a guy with a lot of expenses. He has a lot of ex-wives. He has a lot of children with those ex-wives. He's even got children with other people's wives. And he is an expensive guy. So he borrowed £800,000. It's just that the bank didn't think he was um, good for the money. So they required a guarantor. The guarantor stepped forward. Just two months before, Boris Johnson made him the chairman of the BBC. Now, I'm so old, I remember when countries like Italy were famous for this kind of paola, were famous for this kind of corruption. We used to laugh at them. My father, God rest his soul, was forever talking about how Italy had a new prime minister every few months. Italy had a new finance minister, foreign minister, every few months. Italian government was a revolving door between parliament, government house, and big business. Italian politics was a country where, I don't know, prime ministers got £800,000 in a loan guaranteed by a guy that they then gave a top blue chip position in the state too. But that happened in Britain, in these revelations in the Sunday Times today. Now, I don't see how the British Broadcasting Corporation can continue to be chaired by a man who got his position corruptly. Who can say otherwise? Nobody knew that he guaranteed an £800,000 loan just two months before he got this position. So I am going to say he got it corruptly. Come and prove it if it is otherwise. Why did you, Mr. Chairman, give Boris... What first attracted you to guaranteeing £800,000 for the rapacious Boris Johnson? British politicians traditionally get into trouble over either sex or money. In Boris Johnson's case, it is both. He only needs the money because of his rake's progress through public life over decades, in and out of other people's bedrooms, in and out of other people's marriages. That's why he needs the money. That's why he didn't run to become Prime Minister again, because he can't afford to be the British Prime Minister. He needs the millions that are to be found on the Paola side of the tracks. Mind you, Rishi Sunak is doing such a catastrophically bad job. He was fined for the second time this week for not wearing a seatbelt on camera giving an interview. Stupid or arrogant or both stupid and arrogant and we are very badly challenged here in britain because if it's not rishi sunak it'll have to be boris johnson again and if it's not sunak or johnson there'll have to be a general election and then it'll be starmer sir keir starmer who's broken every promise he has ever made to the Labour Party, to the country, and is possessed of the most tyrannical, abusive, authoritarian instincts that I reiterate my view that a majority Labour government in Britain is an existential threat to the existence of the state. Apart from anything else, Scotland would be off and running a separate Scotland run by the people who are, frankly, predators, preying 
on our little children. They have doubled down on their plan to ask children between 5 and 12 if they are heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, or leaning towards transsexual. That's the government we've got in Scotland. And that policy, that set of policies, as has been lacerated by J.K. Rowling today on social media, is so disturbing that leading nationalist politicians pose in front of signs bearing guillotines threatening to cut the heads of something they call TERFs. Now, I'm too old and too working class to fully grasp what a TERF is, what a cis woman is. But younger and cleverer people tell me it is that they want to cut the heads off those who don't accept that a man can become a woman by simply declaring themselves so, can go into a changing room and wave their still extant dick around whilst pretending to be a woman and frightening the horses and terrorizing the little girls in the changing room. In Primark, in the swimming pool, in the gymnasium, at the keep fit class, in the girl guides, anywhere that girls, women, have over a long time actually in Britain fought and won rights to their own private spaces. Call me old fashioned, it makes me sick. But that's the independent Scotland that we would have. Doesn't it make you wish you were Chinese celebrating the Chinese New Year? It does me. Fasten your seatbelts. This is the mother of all talk shows.